This is Lauren Dunlap, Executive Director for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, or ADA, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm happy to host this afternoon's educational webinar. ADA's mission is to provide support and advocate for the greater than 25 million Americans living with immune disorders. ADA works to promote research and create better awareness of immune disorders. This is ADA's sixth educational webinar for 2023, and today I will be joined by Dr. Ruba Abdahadi. Dr. Abdahadi is Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, Director of Nutrition Support at Children's Mercy, and the Associate Director of Education and Staff Development. Dr. Abdahadi's clinical scope of practice focuses on nutritional rehabilitation of children with various nutritional disorders and gastrointestinal conditions, um, nutritional rehabilitation, and short gut and intestinal failure and malabsorption. Dr. Abdahadi also has a special interest in parental and internal nutritional support. Dr. Abhadi is a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatrics and American Board of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, who serves on multiple national boards. Dr. Abdahadi sits as Secretary Treasurer of the National Board of Physician Nutrition Specialists, Chair of the Aspen Pediatric Section and the Aspen Malnutrition Committee. In addition, she serves as the Clinical Advisory Board of the Global and Enteral Device Sup Supplier Association. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdahadi, for joining us this afternoon. We are eager to hear about your presentation. I'm very excited for it. Thank you so much for having me, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be here and to support Ada. You do such a great job advocating for our patients. And so I'm very grateful for the honor of, um, of allowing me to share with you the talk today. Um, we chose gluten-sensitive neuropathy or celiac disease because it has an autoimmune background. And uh, we thought we would share with you some information about celiac disease, including how it, um, how it presents, how it, uh, how it starts, the pathogenesis, the complications, and the treatment. And so celiac, uh, the word celiac comes from uh, Greek and uh, it translates to something abdominal. And um, it, right now there has been improved awareness of celiac disease. And so the more you know about the disease, the more you are able to, to catch it and diagnose it. And so the prevalence has increased, not necessarily because of um, um, of disease uh, prevalence itself, maybe there is there is a com there is a factor of increased awareness that is making us catch it um, at a higher rate than before. It is an autoimmune disease. Like most of other diseases, you need two hits. The first hit is a genetic predisposition, and the second hit is an the environmental trigger. So for celiac to present, the patient has to have some genetic susceptibility. We call them HLA-DQ2 and, uh, I'm sorry, HLA-DQ2 and DQ8. Um, these uh, genetic um, background has some genes in common with type 1 diabetes. And so you see uh, endocrinologists screening for celiac every time they have a patient with type 1 diabetes or childhood onset diabetes. They want to keep an eye, be on the lookout for celiac disease because of the shared genetic background. You also need some environmental trigger. So you need something in the environment to show the disease or tr to trigger it. Many people may have the genetic susceptibility for celiac, but they may never develop celiac. And so for it to show, you need the genetic predisposition, and then you need something in the environment to trigger it. And so the prevalence, um, the prevalence, like I said, the more you look for it, the more you find it. And so if you look at the prevalence from a small intestinal biopsy standpoint, it, it is roughly one in 500, but there are some studies that have shown that it is as prevalent as one in 100 or one in 133, depending on the, depending on the, on the patient population that you're looking at. And from, a, from an ethnic background, there are some studies that have shown a 5% prevalence in, for example, the Sahrawi population. And so it is an autoimmune disease, and the way it starts, first of all, you need the patient to have the genetic susceptibility, and then the genetic susceptibility with the right 
triggering factor, um, gluten protein in wheat, barley, and rye leads to an abnormal permeability in the intestines. And so there is some, some process that allows for an agent to, to, to go between the cells and can cause the damage. And so the abnormal permeability means that there is some loosening of the tight junctions between the cells that line the small intestine. And so when there is loose, looseness of these tight junctions, the macromolecules are penetrating between the cells and, and in kind of invading between the cells to trigger their immune cascade and start breaking down the small intestine. And so it is T cell mediated. Um, this, is, this T cell means that this is part of a lymph like lymphocytes, a type of uh, immune cells that are supposed to be protecting the body against infection, against germs. And so in this case, the T cells are attacking self instead of attacking bacteria and germs and, and, and microbes. And so um, there is, um, like there's a cascade of events that leads to the inflammation and the damage and the destruction. And so um, these patients were found to have um, like a, a high a expression of ICAM. ICAM is an intracellular adhesion molecule, and it has been implicated in many immune disorders and inflammatory disorders. And so there is a heightened inflammatory response, and this triggers the inflammation and the subsequent damage to the intestines. And here I list like the genetic predisposition. And so instead of the body forming antibodies to like to attack bacteria or viruses, in this particular situation, the body has developed autoantibody against self. And one of them is anti-endomysial antibody, and one of them is anti-reticulin, and one of them is anti-tissue transglutaminase. And so and so these, these antibodies are attacking the, the, um, the self and leading to destruction of the uh, absorptive lining of the small intestine. And so a diagram shows that the gluten is ingested and then it is broken down to the gliadin peptides. And then these are penetrating between the cells of the small intestine because of the permeability or the looseness of the junctions. And so when they are penetrating in there, they're triggering an inflammatory, like an inflammation. And uh, some of the inflammatory components, something called interleukin-2, interleukin-15 cytokines, and then they break down, they break down, um, they, they connect with some antigens, and then that leads to the breakdown of, of the lining of the small intestine and then we lose the, absorpt the absorptive surface of the small intestine. So instead of us having very nice uh, finger-like projections in the intestine that help us absorb the food, the, the proteins, the, uh, the, the, the sugars, and the fat, instead of allowing us to absorb all these good nutrients, these finger-like projections, or we call them villi, they become shorter and shorter, they get broken down, and in severe cases of celiac, they are completely erased. So that's type 4 on the right side of the slide. This uh, diagram on the right side, the hypoplastic type 4, like in that case, the finger-like projections that are supposed to be nice and long and slender, they're completely broken down to the point that they are completely erased. And so we lose so much surface area which we, which we need to absorb our nutrients to grow, we lose that and then the person is not able to, to benefit from the nutrition that they are taking and they have all of these symptoms that we will get to in a minute. So here's another diagram on the left side of the slide. You see nice looking villi, long, tall and slender. And on the right side, like the, the severe case of celiac, you can see the, um, the complete erased, like the completely erased or effaced uh, villi. 
that are broken down. Now the black dots, these are the lymphocytes. So this also um, this also kind of correlates with the severe with the severity of the inflammation because the more there are intraepithelial lymphocytes, the more there is damage and inflammation. So you can look at the left side of the slide like it is uh, March March zero or March one, which is a kind of a milder situation or a mild, milder case of inflammation and then on the right side complete damage and very very bad inflammation the whole the whole part of this intestine cannot absorb anything because we lost so much surface area and so the clinical presentation really it is a wide spectrum it's like it is a it is a mimicker it mimics everything like celiac is has such weird and, and, and variable presentation that you really have to keep it in mind. For physicians, we, we really need to keep it in mind, not forget about it and look for it so that we will not miss it. There are GI manifestations. There are manifestations outside of the digestive system. There are also a group of patients who do not have symptoms at all. And there is a group of patients who have very, very, very mild symptoms. And so for, a, for the symptoms, it really varies with age. If they are young, like if they are one year, year old or two years old, the highest uh, prevalence of presentations is diarrhea and uh, vomiting and um, irritability, um, inability to grow, and um, like their belly is big. And then when they are going to, like when they are growing and when it presents in a school age student, for example, in a school age child, um, the, the prevalence of vomiting, diarrhea, and, and, um, and poor growth is not as, as impressive as smaller children. And then if it presents in the teens or the young adults, it presents in a different way from from children the the way it presents like mostly with fatigue tiredness poor energy um, um, many of them have short stature an unexplained short stature or um, um, like without with minimal gi symptoms they can present with infertility they can present with the uh, frequent uh, like um, uh, bone fractures without a clear explanation and so the presentation is very variable depending on the age of presentation now since we you're losing the small bowel they're going to have malnutrition because they cannot benefit from the food that they are eating because their intestines is not able to absorb it and so like i said Depending on the age, you get a different presentation. The atypical presentation of celiac happens in the older, um, like teens or young adults, with minimal GI symptoms and with fatigue, tiredness, and unexplained anemia, unexplained iron deficiency. Now, the, the extra intestinal, some symptoms outside of the GI tract, some skin uh, manifestations, some dental manifestations, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, unexplained short stature, delayed puberty, um, hepatitis or elevation of the liver enzymes and uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, joint pains, bone pains and brittle bone, uh, unexplained seizures, uh, some calcifications in the brain, um, poor balance, some depression, anxiety, psychiatric disorders, and infertility. So you can you can appreciate how variable the presentation is. Now, in in the silent, what we call silent celiac, really there are no symptoms and signs whatsoever. And then they get they have an endoscopy for a different reason. They may have an endoscopy for for uh, heartburn. They may get an, an endoscopy for um, reflux. They may get an endoscopy for um, for abdominal pain, and then you you find you find uh, manifestations of celiac under the microscope in the in the duodenum. And so this this is a finding. This silent celiac is not the commonest presentation, and so 
Luckily, they, we usually get some symptoms to go after, but it is not uncommon to have a silent celiac. Now, the latent celiac, again, there are no symptoms and signs, and, and even you, you do the endoscopy and the, the, the histology of the bowel is normal, but, the, but there are antibodies in the blood, and so you, you do some screening labs, you do like a celiac antibody screen, and you find out antibodies there, but it is just like that they did not do any damage to the intestines just yet. We call it latent. And so the, the symptomatic celiac is really the tip of the iceberg. It is the higher most part, but there is, there is a variety of patients who have the latent celiac and the, the silent celiac. And I'll get to the genetic susceptibility in a minute to talk about like how we can, how we can stratify the risk. This is a summary that we just mentioned. The presentation varies with age. And um, other extra intestinal manifestations include uh, joint pains and joint swelling. Um, and um, um, there are some reported cases of uh, juvenile chronic arthritis, uh, dental enamel um, abnormalities and defects is another manifestation of celiac, uh, short stature, delayed puberty. So among the workup for short stature, we need tissue transglutaminase or we need like the autoantibodies of celiac to be able to screen for it. Unexplained hepatitis and unexplained elevation of the liver enzymes. Um, some neurologic symptoms like poor balance or inability to balance and even intractable seizures have been reported to be a manifestation of celiac. Um, now there is no evidence. There is no evidence that there is an association between autism and celiac disease, or between um, attention deficit and celiac disease. But some manifestations of celiac can be depression and anxiety. Other symptoms also bone, uh, like poor bone density and poor poor like uh, bone, um, like structure, brittle bone or, um, or thinning of the bone uh, because the, the body, the intestines are not able to absorb calcium and vitamin D and, and benefit from them for the benefit of the, of the bones. Uh, unexplained iron deficiency anemia because the intestines is where you absorb iron. If the intestines are erased or like their lining is effaced or inflamed, the, the intestines are not able to absorb the iron. So even if you are consuming iron or taking iron supplements, the body is not going to be able to benefit from the iron. So they have an iron deficiency that is resistant to, uh, to treatment. Uh, this is an example of skin manifestation. We call it dermatitis herpetiformis. And so, um, and so this is like a famous uh, exam, like board exam question. What do you find under the microscope if you biopsy the skin lesion? And it, the answer is dermal granular IgA deposit. So there's immune globulin. There's a, some sort of antibody that is deposited in these lesions if you take a biopsy and evaluate it under the microscope uh, out of the skin. Now, infertility is another uncommon uh, manifestation in the young adults, uh, unexplained infertility. And so um, even, even celiac fathers, not only, not, only, um, not only mothers, like if the father has celiac, the, the newborn baby may have low birth weight and prematurity, there are reported cases. So, the diagnosis for celiac has been revised over the past uh, years. And so in 1970, the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition um, advocated for diagnosing celiac by showing that the lining of the intestine is completely erased. Look at the surface. It is very, very smooth. You don't see anything, any finger-like projections. You don't see any villi. And so now this is no longer the case. Um, the new diagnosis or the new diagnostic criteria is you do not need to have a complete breakdown of the lining to call it celiac. You can call it celiac before reaching that that stage. These are findings in the in the endoscopy, and so we need to see 
nice looking folds in the intestine and if you take a closer look at these folds you see the finger like projections on, on the lining of these folds now in celiac the the, the finger like projections or the lie are, are erased partially or completely and then the folds are also effaced and you don't see very nice uh, robust folds anymore and uh, in addition you can see folds what there see you see fissuring and cracking and mosaic pattern and these are all features that it may be celiac we cannot call it celiac until we have confirmed under the microscope the histology so endoscopic findings are supportive but for you to call it celiac you really need the concrete evidence in the uh, histology uh, from the biopsies that you take and here's another example of mosaic pattern and fissuring of the lining of the intestines. You need minimum four biopsies for the, for the physicians who take care of patients with celiac. We need minimum four biopsies of the intestine in order to evaluate uh, under the microscope and confirm that this is what we're dealing with. And so here's another example. On the left side of the slide, you can see nice looking villi very nice long slender um, you can see how long how big of a surface area it is but on the right hand side there is blunting and flattening so like the surface is so smooth and it is very poor or very little surface area with a lot of inflammation and so if you also take a closer look you can see the intraepithelial lymphocytes these are the the cells that are responsible for inflammation and triggering the inflammatory cascade and break down the, in, the lining of the intestines. And so here is another example of intraepithelial lymphocytes in the villa. See, it's, it's not completely broken down yet. It is still long and slender, but there, there is beginning of invasion of these uh, inflammatory cells into the, the villus. And, um, and so you need like it's like pieces of the puzzle one piece of the puzzle is the presentation the clinical presentation another piece is, that can help you solve the puzzle the with is the antibodies so the antibodies is a blood test uh, one of them like i mentioned anti-endomysial antibody and one of them is tissue transglutaminase and so this is a simple blood test that can help you decide like screen if we should scope them, put them under endos for endoscopy or not. And so we do this screening test whenever we want to, to, to determine if we should proceed with an endoscopy because we can't be putting everybody through endoscopy. We can't be like, like performing endoscopy on the, entire, on the entire patient population. So these blood tests can kind of help us triage and determine who, who deserves who, weren't, who, who should get an endoscopy and we should take a closer look for celiac versus others who we don't need to worry about it too much. Um, these tests, one of them is anti-endomysial antibody, the EMA. It is more expensive than the tissue transglutaminase and it is the higher specificity and sensitivity, but it is more expensive. And so before we do the anti-endomysial antibody, we do, we do the tissue transcutaminase. If it is abnormal, then we do the anti-endomysial antibody kind of a confir confirmation test. And this way we can, we can like allocate resources wisely and we won't have to, to, to use expensive testing unless we really have to. Now for the celiac um, genetic, genetic background, like I said, this is only telling us what is the genetic susceptibility of the patient. It doesn't tell us that they have celiac. It just tells us if they are at risk or not at risk, how much at risk are they. And so you only do it if you, if the family of the patient is specifically ask you, ask you, will I ever develop celiac or not? So depending on the number of genes, you can tell them, no, you will never get celiac because you do not have DQ2 or DQ8. You're, or you will have, you're, there's very, very likelihood that you will ever have it. Now, if they are DQ2 positive, double, like DQ2 positive, DQ2 positive, you can tell them that you have, you have both genes and you have very high chances of developing celiac because you have all of the genes. So this is kind of a risk stratification. It doesn't tell you 
that the patient does have or does not have celiac. It only tells you what is their genetic risk, what is their risk based of, on their genes. And so it is an expensive test, and you know, you have to think twice before you order it because this may have some implications on, on, on health insurance. So you have to counsel, we have to counsel the patient to tell them, this is going to tell us what is your genetic risk, but it doesn't tell us that you have it or you do not have it right now. Now, there are some benefits from this genetic testing. It can like clarify the risk and improve the psychologic burden. And it can also help us interpret lab tests. And it can also give us an idea about whether we should put them through gluten-free diet or not. And so, um, and so moving, moving to the prevalence of celiac disease with other disease pathology, as I mentioned, there are some genetic, uh, some genes shared between celiac disease and type 1 diabetes. There is also some genetic uh, association between thyroid and thyroiditis and celiac disease. Other autoimmune diseases, such as connective tissue diseases, Sjogren's syndrome, primary biliary cirrhosis, the Downs, Williams, and Turner syndrome. So there is some genetic association between celiac and these disorders, and, and the, preva the prevalence is mentioned on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, there are also some associations with autoimmune conditions in the heart, autoimmune myocarditis in, in the pancreas, like, in, like diabetes, in the thyroid, in addition to alopecia, and so there is um, a strong association with autoimmune conditions. And so, in, like I mentioned, in type 1 diabetes, we have to screen with labs. And if they are abnormal, then we would proceed with an endoscopy to confirm the diagnosis of celiac. And uh, in Down syndrome, the prevalence of celiac is somewhere between 5 to 12%. And in that case, typically they have iron deficiency anemia and stunted height and poor growth and bone, like a brittle bone. And so in Downs, we really have to screen for celiac. And um, the complications include hyposplenism and uh, malignancy in, like in, uh, in rare situations. In addition to the side effects or like the ad the the the, the extra intestinal manifestations in the skin and teeth and the short stature and delayed puberty. So these are all complications of an undiagnosed celiac. In the hyposplenism, the spleen is, uh, is, uh, is small and it leads to um, like high risk of, of clotting or thrombosis. And we confirm that with, with imaging studies. And um, and then in, in the non-responsive celiac or in the refractory celiac, we want to look for other potential diagnoses because we don't want to miss Crohn's disease and think that it is celiac. And we don't want to miss a, a concomitant food allergy such as cow milk protein allergy or, uh, or, um, or other potential like food-related allergies or intolerances. Um, if we have a non-responsive celiac, we want to look for hidden sources of gluten. Um, the treatment for celiac disease is gluten-free diet for life. Uh, if we have an unresponsive celiac, we have to start thinking about hidden sources of gluten or a wrong diagnosis or an irritable bowel syndrome or a pancreas insufficiency. And so um, there are some studies that, um, that have that have shown that uh, a poorly um, controlled celiac has led to uh, like, um, like a T-cell lymphoma, a MELT lymphoma. And, um, and in the case of refractory uh, celiac, we may need the more aggressive treatment besides gluten-free diet, such as immune suppressive treatment. Um, in, in rare occasions, celiac can lead to malignancy. And there would be like abnormal cells and pleomorphic cells in the, um, in the biopsies. And so, as mentioned, the treatment for celiac is, uh, is lifelong gluten-free diet. 
And so the oats themselves, um, from a genetic background, they are different from wheat and barley and rye. They are entirely unrelated. And so oats are safe for celiac disease patients. But uh, the reason the reason oats are, are avoided is that they may be coming from a plant or from a from a, like a factory that processes gluten. And so there may be a cross contamination of oats with gluten, but oats themselves are genetically different from gluten and they are safe for, for celiac disease patients as long as you confirm that there is no cross contamination. And so if the product is certified gluten free then and it contains oat, then this means that the, 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 the manufacturer or the industry have eliminated any exposure to gluten or any potential cross-contamination. Now, lactose has not, no relation to, to celiac disease. If they have lactose intolerance, this can be related to um, like a, um, a lactase insufficiency or a lactase deficiency. So this is an unrelated um, subject. Now, if there is inflammation of the intestine because of celiac, the lactase itself is not produced by the lining. And so lactose uh, can become tolerated and can be okay if you take better control of celiac disease by having them be on gluten-free diet. If you have them on a gluten-free diet and the intestines recover and heal, the intestines can go back to making lactase and then the patient can be able to, to, to tolerate lactose again. Um, milk protein allergy is a different disease because, the, because in that case, the milk protein itself, the milk protein itself is the trigger uh, for the like for the for the intolerance and the question if you if we get a question from a parent or from a patient how much can I have gluten how much can I have of my favorite uh, like food uh, the answer is usually zero because we don't know how much of um, of gluten is okay without causing damage we don't know how much is a dose that can lead to damage. So the answer usually is like zero. How much can I have out of wheat, barley, or rye? The answer is zero. And so there are a lot of um, associations and, uh, and support groups, celiac.com, Celiac Pro Association, National Foundation for Celiac Awareness. There is a lot out there. And so uh, now with gluten-free diet becoming more available, um, treatment to celiac is not as challenging. Now, it fact remains, not all patients with celiac can afford um, a gluten-free diet. And so there is so much work we can do to advocate for these patients so that they can have a more available gluten-free diet that is affordable. And so in summary, um, so in summary, there are different parts in the diagnosis of celiac. One of them is the clinical. Uh, what is the patient complaining of? In the case of latent and silent celiac, they are not complaining of anything. And then you find an abnormal endoscopy or an abnormal uh, screening lab. And so a blood work for the antibodies can help us screen for celiac or, or triage who needs an endoscopy or not. The ultimate diagnosis is with the endoscopy. And then we leave the genetic uh, testing for risk stratification. It is not part of the routine workup for celiac. And so um, I wanted to um, touch base uh, with, the, with the clarification on the difference between irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, versus inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. And so they're very similar in the name, in the name, and so they can easily be um, mistaken for one another, but they're completely different diseases. The irritable bowel syndrome normally is a diagnosis that has um, that has um, 
been reached after a complete workup looking for other diagnoses to explain abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gassiness, and not found any, any answers. So typically in irritable bowel syndrome, they have had an endoscopy, normal endoscopy, normal biopsies, and they uh, benefit from conservative management, lifestyle changes, biofeedback, um, low FODMAP diet. There are some strategies that can help manage irritable bowel syndrome. Now, inflammatory bowel disease, by, by the name, there is inflammation on a tissue level. So you take the biopsies and you look at them under the microscope and you see like inflammatory cells, you see lymphocytes, plasma cells, you see inflammation under the microscope. And it is an umbrella that encompasses multiple diseases, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It is a spectrum of diseases. And so there is indeterminate colitis in the middle. And these patients, of course, conservative management and lifestyle changes help, but they really need a stronger medicine with a biologic, infliximab, adalimumab. I mean, there are antibodies that are, um, I'm sorry, there are, there are biologics that target autoantibodies to put the disease under better control. And in, inflammatory bowel disease, it is a hypermetabolic state, and so they are at a higher risk for having malnutrition more than irritable bowel syndrome. Because in irritable bowel syndrome, despite the abdominal pain and gassiness and diarrhea or constipation, their intestines are still able to absorb nutrition, while in inflammatory bowel disease, their um, their, this, their intestines or their digestive system is not necessarily able to process the nutrients, but also the, the degree of inflammation consumes all of the calories away from the body. And instead of nurturing the body, all of the calories are wasted on uh, feeding into the inflammation. And so both diseases are very disruptive to the quality of life and to the person's well-being, but their treatment approach is different from one another. And so um, I'd like to to end here, and I and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I wanted to make it to keep it brief because because I wanted to make sure that we have any like we can address any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for having me again. Thank, thank you, Dr. Abdahadi. Now we're going to open it up to questions from our audience members. Um, while those are coming in, I did think of something um, that might be helpful for our audience. Um, is what do you feel has been the most helpful to your patients living with celiac disease? I think what was what I found very helpful is um, like is the whole family supporting the child. We have teenagers and we have school age children with celiac disease, and what I found most supportive is if the whole family like supports the the child with their like with their like shopping, with their meal preparation. Uh, like I found this very helpful because I felt that like the whole family can can you don't have to to plan two different meals or two different menus you don't have to to worry about contamination if the family goes gluten free this can really help take better control over the disease because you don't have to worry about the the child craving gluten containing food and you don't have to worry about contamination and you don't have to worry about accidental accidental exposure or eating something they're not supposed to be eating especially the young ones because you know you know that how, how children are like they want to eat what you're eating they don't want the special food for themselves and so for families sharing the same menu and the same shopping and going gluten-free that's, that's a mental I, support as well a mental and emotional support to have the whole family working as one system so that maybe the the child or the you know, yeah, whoever it is yeah. might not feel left out, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, also, I think this is coming up a lot because you know how 
gluten free diet is is a hot button now in in the world we live in what is what will happen to a normal person that is not diagnosed with celiac disease and they actually do go to a gluten free diet is there are there any changes that actually occur or is this just you know kind of hollywood or playing off, oh, it's, it's good to be gluten-free, you know, X, Y, Z for health reasons. Is that actually any truth to that whatsoever? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> honestly, because I know that Dr. Bracken, my colleague, she, she actually looked into like what is the highest uh, Googled phrase or word and she found gluten-free diet was a very, very hot, uh, like very highly searched uh, um, like Google phrase and so yeah I know that it is like it's very trendy it's like fashionable I know that people some people advocate for gluten-free diet they feel that they've never felt better in their life uh, what I can tell you is that gluten-free diet can be uh, can be balanced and healthy and you don't, you're not going to miss out on any nutrients by going gluten-free now, do people feel better on gluten-free diet? I think this is open for, for discussion. Some people swear by gluten-free diet and they don't want to go back ever again. But other people say, I went gluten-free and I didn't see any difference. So, so the, the, the bottom line, gluten-free diet is balanced and nurturing and you can, you can be healthy and eat gluten-free diet. You're not going to miss out on anything. The, the 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 whole brand uh, bread or like the high fiber bread or any of those they can be they can we can live without them and we can find other sources of of fiber uh, without missing out on anything if we go gluten free but I don't think I can tell you yes everybody let's go gluten free it, we will live the best life ever because I have no way of proving this. It's really, it's really variable. Different people have different perception and different, um, different responses to gluten-free diet. Now, if it's celiac, yes, go gluten-free for life. If it is a not, not a diagnosed celiac, I think you want to try it and see if, it, if you feel better, if your belly, if you don't have gas, if you, if you have better energy, then then it may work for you but i cannot i cannot tell you that it is the best thing for everybody um so kind of to piggyback off that question one of our audience members um said i have been on a gluten-free diet for 10 years but i have gotten testing that shows i do not have celiac i would like to go back to when i tr i try to add back into my diet i have uh, stomach upset and pain do you have any advice on incorporating gluten back into her diet after 10 years? I think that um, you can you can go you can if you are interested you can incorporate it back, but maybe in 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 gradual increments. Maybe you can reintroduce gluten in a small amount and then reevaluate. Maybe keep a journal. You can keep a journal of how you're feeling, like energy level, fatigue, uh, pains, abdominal pain, uh, nausea, how your bowel movement is like. Maybe keep a journal and then keep like kind of a planner and then advance the amount gradually and see how you feel. Because if you, if, if you do not have celiac, then, then you, you are safe to reintroduce it but I think this depends on your comfort in terms of how fast or how uh, slow you want to reincorporate it. But usually transitioning back, the safest thing is to transition back gradually, slowly, so that you can be mindful and aware of any changes in, in your symptoms. Mm -hmm. too, ma too many changes all at once is never a good idea on any platform, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, if you took what what is the prevalence of, of celiac disease in the u.s or even on a global level and i'm curious to know has there have you as practitioners seen an increase over the last decade or so again I'm, we all know that the technology has gotten better but is is there a growing prevalence of the condition or are we just becoming more aware of it 
Uh, I think genetically, uh, genetically depends on the on the on the patient population or like the the, the study group or like the the study subjects that you are looking into. Uh, because now with the with the industrialized world and with the like the like with with the traveling and with with the global like um, with the global initiative or or like with the in underdeveloped countries becoming more um, into processed food, I think maybe the prevalence is changing between underdeveloped and and developed world. But I think that the prevalence is going up only because we are testing for it, and I don't think that. I don't think that the genetic predisposition is necessarily different, but maybe we are more aware of it, so we are screening for it more. We are, we have the um, the resources to to run a tissue transglutaminase and anti-endometrial antibody and catch it better, and then do the endoscopy and confirm it. And you know, surprisingly, even in this day and age, we still get surprised every now and then that we have this patient. So we find celiac in a small bowel biopsy without ever thinking about it. It was never in our differential. It was never our our like go-to diagnosis. And then we are surprised to find it. So some examples would be a teenager who is healthy, growing, and without abdominal pain and, and without short stature and, and completely healthy. And then we are performing an endoscopy for, for example, um, for a different reason. Or we, for example, we were, we were gonna catch a foreign body or we were going to do an endoscopy and we, we took a biopsy from the small bowel and then we were surprised to find celiac disease. And so it still happens that, I, that celiac catches us by surprise because of the very wide range of symptoms and presentations that it can present with, especially in the in the teenagers and the young adults. Do you think that any um, the more modernization and, and incorporation of genetically modified foods have anything to do with the rising prevalence of celiac disease or the impact it may have on those patients? I think that it is indirectly related. I think with the with the processed food, with the processed food, we are seeing more patients with with abdominal pain, constipation, gassiness, bloating, nausea, and then we are performing more endoscopies, and so we are catching celiac in an indirect way. So I don't think that the processed food is making celiac more more often or more prevalent, I think the processed food or the diet or the industrialized or westernized diet is uh, triggering a lot of GI symptoms leading to more endoscopy. And then we are catching celiac more with labs and screening and endoscopy. So in an indirect way, the industrialized diet or the, the yeah, the, the this is, giving us more reason to investigate and catch celiac, but not necessarily the food itself causing celiac. Um, thank you, Abdahadi, Dr. Abdahadi. Um, one of our audience members says, if, if a patient has experienced symptoms related to celiac disease and desires to undergo testing and evaluation, would it be more appropriate for them to consult with a gastroenterologist or an immunologist? I think um, both of them are, are good to see. Your primary care physician can order a tissue transglutaminase. So a tissue transglutaminase can be ordered by the primary care physician. And that would be, um, you don't have to get a bill from an immunologist or a GI doctor. You can have your PCP order a tissue transglutaminase, IgA. And so this can be your screening test. Now, if it is abnormal, it, if it is very high, then it would it would definitely make sense to see a GI physician and and go through the endoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. So the immunologist will not confirm the diagnosis to you because they're not going to be capable of performing the the upper endoscopy, but the gastroenterologist will. And so my opinion is the primary to get the the celiac antibody screen. And if positive, see a GI physician and get an upper endoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. 
thank you. Um, we have another question from an audience member, and I will say I have I have heard this too um, from other people. Some people say that even with celiac, they can consume gluten-containing items in other countries, like in Europe. Does celiac have an association with pesticides or differences in regulation in other country countries versus the U.S. that you know of? And this also comes up in even the allergy immunology world as well, this question. Uh, I honestly don't know uh, what are the regulations in other countries or what are like their body of, of like regulation, like the FDA equivalent um, mm -hmm. in, in other parts of the world. I know that a hidden source of gluten is, uh, for example, uh, salad dressing. Salad dressing typically may may probably contains gluten, and so digging into the history, you may find a hidden source of gluten in salad dressing. And so I do not, the answer I do not know how other parts of the world regulate um, their like gluten free or like the gluten exposure. Um, and so I think reading labels because if if the product is is gluten free certified, I think you should be okay. But I cannot comment on the accuracy or how robust their gluten, their gluten-free certification is like in other parts of the world. Well, I know from my understanding, um, there are more restrictions in place for um, labeling as well as regulation of food. Um, from what I do, what I do know, but I don't know exactly what they what they do differently. Kind of like what you said. FDA and all that does that yeah. regulate regulating body here rather. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, um, Dr. Abdelhadi, for for being with us this afternoon and and pres um, volunteering your time. And we also want to thank our audience members for tuning into the, this afternoon's presentation. Don't forget to register for our next um, upcoming webinar you see on the screen um, during World Lung Day with um, cardiopulmonary physiotherapist Dr. Shruti Shah. And please do take a few moments to fill out our quick five question survey at the conclusion of this afternoon's webinar. And we hope you today enjoy today's presentation. This is Lauren Dunlap for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, and we hope you have a healthy afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us.